We're up to chapter 3 of Ephesians. In the first chapter, we were introduced by the use of particular words became clear that God has a purpose. His pleasure and purpose was... To make us his children. So the, the, the purpose was to make us his children. He had a plan. Can anybody remember the plan? Because I can't show you. <laughs> that he would unite all things. That he would unite all things in heaven and on earth under the lordship of Christ. We tend to think of that in terms of the kingdom of God. So that what God intended was that the kingdom of God would become the rule on earth. Isn't that part of the prayer we pray? In heaven, on earth as in heaven. That the kingdom may come on earth as in heaven. So God's plan is that all things would be united under Christ as the head. And the promise, the promise that this would be fulfilled by the power of the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit would be the means by which the message and the ministry of Christ would become a reality in the whole world. So we have a little circle. The circle being that the Spirit's involved in us becoming children of God. That the Spirit is involved in God's plan becoming a fulfilment of all things being under the headship of Christ. And the Spirit is our seal and our guarantee that all these things are possible. We live in a world where very often it's difficult to believe that that is even possible. But here is the promise of God that, and, the, and the guarantee of God and the pledge of God, the seal of God, that at some point in history, this becomes a reality. In chapter 2, we talked about reconciliation. The first part of the chapter talked about the way in which the sacrifice which Jesus made on the cross has in some way reconciles us to God. That because of what Jesus has done, we can find forgiveness and hope. That reconciliation between us and God is complete as a gift. As a gift. Not as something we earn because we couldn't. We just couldn't earn that kind of perfection. So now God and humanity can relate because Jesus brought the love of God to us and reconciled us to God. The second part of the chapter was a way in which then becomes a practical reality, not just in my life, but as it happens in the life of the world. The reconciled people promote reconciliation. The reconciled people promote Reconciliation. So Paul is now called to promote reconciliation between Jews who see themselves as reconciled to God through the law and Gentiles who are without God and without hope according to what Paul wrote in the chapter 1. So here we have a reconciliation occurring in the practicality of life. So Paul is is promoting reconciliation as a ministry and a mission which God has in the world for us to complete. So the plan has begun, but the plan is not complete. Until all things in heaven and on earth are reconciled to God through Christ. So the process of reconciliation goes on. It's not just between Jews and Gentiles. It's wherever reconciliation is required. So how does it continue? 
Jesus began the message. Jesus began the story. When he came, he came into a culture and a world where the religion of the day and the culture of the day agreed that unless you were healthy, wealthy and wise, you were cursed by God. If you are poor, unintelligent or sick, you are cursed by God. Therefore, God didn't love you. There must be something wrong with you. And it struck me a little later that this not, was not because they'd done anything wrong. And Jesus made a point of pointing that out when somebody asked, uh, what has this person done wrong that he'd been born blind? Or what did his parents do wrong? Or how come he's born blind? And Jesus said, it's got nothing to do with that. It's so that the glory of God will be shown. So the link between sin and sickness or sin and outcastness is broken. These people aren't guilty of any sin which makes them poor, sick or outcast. It's something else which Jesus is to deal with. And he does. Paul's mission is to the Gentiles. Now it's also struck me that the Gentiles really didn't do anything wrong by being Gentiles. They just happened to belong to a different culture. And the Jews determined that they could not be connected with God unless they became Jews or proselyte Jews. So what is it, why is it that these people are separate from God, except that it's a cultural separation. Jesus comes and says, everyone belongs. The poor belong. They are not cursed by God. The Samaritans belong. They are not rejected by God. They're not Jews, and they're not linked to that theme which... Judaism continues, but they're not rejected by God. Jesus came to reconcile those people to God and to show them, to prove to them, even by dying on a cross, that God loves them. Gentiles, Jews, he didn't go into the Gentile world. His ministry was within the world that he lived in, which was the Jewish world, and he left the mission of the church to follow that off, to continue the mission to reconcile other people to God. And so we have the big secret. It was a big secret in the Good News Bible, in the Bible we read and in other versions of the Bible. It's a big mystery. What's the big mystery? And it, it struck me in the beginning of the chapter 3 that we have this big mystery that Paul holds out on for a few verses, almost like he's trying to build the ten tension. What is this big secret or big mystery that God has for the world and has been proclaimed through the apostles and the prophets? What is this mystery? Well, it's the open secret that the Gentiles are included. We've been talking about this for three, two, two and a half chapters now. But Paul wants to make it clear to these Gentile people who I mentioned before, who I wrote on the screen before, were, were somewhat Gnostic. And the, the idea of a secret or a mystery would appeal to them because they believed that they had special knowledge. And here Paul comes with special knowledge. I have a special knowledge which has been true for all time but is now being revealed. Here is the special knowledge the Gentiles can come. The Gentiles were always intended to be part of God's community. There's the big secret. We belong. We're Gentiles. Not because we did anything wrong, but because we, we, we have been excluded. I don't know why. Or what that's about. So here we have good news for people who don't think they are included. 
Have we finished this reconciliation process yet? Is there no one in the world left who doesn't feel that they're included? Or have we got a big secret to share with somebody? That those people who don't think they're included are in fact included if they have the faith to believe it. So how does it continue? We have to ask the question, who then are our Gentiles? Within their culture, the excluded or the outcast were both religious and cultural. It was the same group because they had a religious society. In our culture, they might be completely different things. In the culture, people are Gentiles, you might say, because we don't want to include them. I don't want to become particular about that because I think the way in which each of us sees the world might be slightly different in this way. I might get a bit particular in a minute. It's those people overwhelmed by guilt and shame who feel that they don't belong. And this, this word shame struck me as rather interesting when I, when I began to talk about, think about it because in Christianity we've talked a lot about guilt. We talk a lot, a lot about sin. Somebody done something wrong and it's forgiven. But the sick, the poor and the outcast hadn't done anything particularly wrong. And yet they were rejected. They were considered cursed. They were not suffering with guilt. Well, they might have been, but the, but the, the effect on them is not guilt, but shame. Let me look at that. Guilt says, is it all about behaviour? What we do or what we don't do. Shame is about self. Who am I? What's my value in the world? Guilt says, I'm sorry. I made a mistake. And that can be dealt with. Shame says, I am a mistake. What are you going to do about that? When somebody has perception that they are a mistake in the world, that there's something desperately wrong with me, how can I fix that? Guilt says, I did something wrong. I'm sorry. Shame says, I did something bad and I'm sorry about that. Forgiveness can come from that. But shame says, I am bad. What are you going to do about that? And most of the people that Jesus is dealing with, it seems, and the Gentiles, are dealing with shame, not guilt. They are put in a position where they're, what the society says to them, even the religious society says to them, there's something wrong with you. It's not that you've done something wrong necessarily, but there is something wrong with you. How do you overcome that? Guilt says, I apologise. And I can be forgiven. I repent of that. Shame says, I'm not worthy of apology. I'm not worthy of anything. This dilemma, this is very much part of how society operates still in the world. We are still people who suffer with guilt on one hand, which we can deal with, and shame on the other, which we have great difficulty dealing with. How did Jesus respond? Jesus responded to the guilty by saying, you're forgiven. There he is. 
How does he respond to those who are suffering shame? I love you. I accept you. I love you. Well, I love you, I forgive you. I think they both love comes to both of them. I love you, I accept you. I accept you just as you are. You know the old hymn. Just as I am. I can come to Jesus just as I am. Guilty or in shame. I can come just as I am. We are all reconciled to God through the act of Jesus, through the life of Jesus, through the example of Jesus. And that struck me as something really important for us to know. We are the people of reconciliation. Who then are our Gentiles? Those are the people we wouldn't necessarily uh, accept into membership. There are people who we wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable having in the building even. There are people we wouldn't put into leadership. There are people we would say, oh, I'm not too sure about that one. Not too sure, not too sure. And suddenly they become victims of shame or guilt. Shame from our perspective because we put them in a box which says they're not okay for us. Church has been through a number of these examples over the years. We did it with women. It's tiny, isn't it? We did it with women. We said, the Bible says women can't do these things, so they can't. Well, I don't believe that. I don't think the Bible even said that. Because if you read Paul a little more clearly than you did when you read Corinthians, you'll see that there's a lot more to Paul than simply the women shall not speak, or whatever he says. If you look what Paul says, you'll find that he deals with women all the time. Jesus certainly did. Children. How long is it since we allowed children to take communion? We told them they couldn't, because they couldn't show on the dotted line that they had been baptised and had faith. What did Jesus say about children? If you're not going to come to me like a child, you're not going to enter the kingdom of God, for goodness sake. But we rejected the children and fell into that sin ourselves and made the children shameful in our view. We did it with Catholics. We didn't do so much with the other protos. But we did it with Catholics. There's something wrong with the Catholics. Not because of their sin, but because of all their practices and all these sorts of things that seem to us to be a little weird. We've certainly done it in, in churches and in culture with what we called, unfortunately, doll bludgers. Our culture says if you don't work, you're a bad person or you're not an acceptable person. There's something wrong with you. And we carried that view into the church to some degree. I think this church has got over that sort of prejudice pretty well. I think you're pretty good at including people from a diverse range of backgrounds within the life of your church. I think that's to be congratulated. You're an inclusive group. Diversity is here. A brief little story about Raja. Uh, at at uh, uh, Living Faith Church, we had a... a Rex had a ministry to refugees. He used to go to, over to Broadmeadows to the refugee centre and he, he met Raj, Raja. Raja was a Muslim man who began a prayer room at the, the centre. He set it up with all the symbols of different faiths 
and anybody was welcome to go in there and pray. And that was what he did. I probably visited him about twice at, in the centre. But because Rex was doing this work and, and I came with him and I'd be, I was the minister, I got to be called his guru at the time. It was very nice. When we left Greensboro, on our last day after 15 years, there was Raja in the congregation. And amongst, amongst the service, Raja stood up and spoke about the care that he'd been given by the by Living Faith Church and how proud he was to be there. I might say he continued to meet with Living Faith Church. He continued to be a Muslim. But he was welcome in the community. He was loved within that community because we loved refugees. I wanted to tell a, a, a brief little bit of personal sharing. I grew up as a, as a, um, a fourth child in a ministry family which means we travelled around a lot, and I had to get involved in different schools at different places. I was a redheaded kid with a fairly thick amount of curly red hair. You, you can't imagine that. You know, try and imagine that. Uh, a fairly thick amount of curly red hair. I wore glasses, little round ones, little John Lennon glasses, and I don't know why, but the fact of red hair and glasses seemed to draw attention to the fact that somebody wanted to break those glasses. I don't quite know why I was the butt of that sort of criticism or teasing or bullying, whatever word you want to put to it, but I was. I wasn't, also wasn't that great at school. I didn't read very well. I couldn't spell and I still can't. This led into a period of, of teenage years where I was clearly a person who felt shame at being a redheaded kid with glasses who couldn't read very well and couldn't spell and didn't do all that well at school. It was probably in my late teens, maybe towards 18 or 19, that I confronted the idea that God loves me. Now you can probably understand why love is a massive theme for me, because that changed my life. The thought that God loves me suggested to me that I was lovable. I just wasn't a horrendous little kid with red hair and glasses who couldn't spell well and couldn't read very well. I was a person who was loved by God. I was a person who was, who was suffering shame. Well, I had things to be guilty about as well. But I was suffering with shame and the truth that God loves me helped me overcome my shame. I couldn't read, I couldn't spell and became a primary school teacher. Before I became a primary school teacher I went and did a vocational guidance test and the person interviewing me over that said, well, you'll probably never get my trick because I'd failed the intelligence test. How do you fail an intelligence I don't know that you can fail an intelligence test. I, got, I obviously got a lower score than you might have done. There were reasons for that. So I went to Bible college eventually after spending 10, 10 or 11 years teaching and got my degree in theology. With, well, the degree says it's got, it says agree with masters, with honours, sorry, not with masters, with honours. 
So I must have done all right. So this shameful little kid who couldn't read, couldn't spell, his life is turned around by the fact that he believes that, believes that God loves him. That's what turned his life around. And he could achieve something if he wanted to. He could talk. He could always talk. Got into trouble for talking. So maybe we have a list of people who are living, who are not welcome in our community, but where people of reconciliation and what we're the whole purpose of our Christianity in terms of bringing the world together is to help people become reconciled with God. Accept people. Not just forgive them. Accept them. It's a difficult mission because it's hard to love the unlovely all those that appear to be unlovely to us. So Paul prays for us for our inner strength and security that God is all, will always be present to us or we will know that fact, that we will know the amazing love of God, that, we will, that he prayed for our empowerment. For this reason I bow the knee before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through the Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints, what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now there's a prayer. And he finishes with the most, one of the most popular benedictions in Christianity. For to him who is by the power of work at work within us, is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can, all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. It's still going on. The mission is not complete. The world does not live under the... is not united under the rule of Christ. We are still part of the continuing life of Jesus on earth and the mission which Paul declares that we have. It's all about valuing love. To love the sinner, yes, but to love the shamed as well. Amen.